Morning, everybody. Welcome to day four of Athena. Hopefully everyone's ex as excited as we are as we get closer to the hack weekend. Um, just a quick one before we get started to say that let us know you're watching, listening, taking part by using the hashtag AthenaHack21 online. But without further ado, I will pass over to Roger from Cisco, who will take you through an introduction to AI. Thanks, everybody. Um... So, uh, as Alex said, so myself and Pedro are from um, Cisco. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to take you through our introduction to artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Um, just to introduce exactly who we are. So Pedro and I, myself work in the developer advocacy team in the UK. So what, does, what do we do? Well, we do everything from cloud to um, automation of infrastructure to AI and AI operations for customers. And that could be anything from, a, from banks to uh, hospitals to industrial customers as well. And, and my team focuses on all of these areas and we get to play with all the cool stuff. So we focus on emerging technologies and we just get to play with stuff which will help Cisco um, drive these technologies um, into our customers and, and drive business uh, innovation. So what we're going to do for the next 90 minutes, and as I said, I'm going to give you an overview of AI so from a very high level. So what is AI and how, it, how our industry using artificial intelligence? And then Pedro, who is the brains of the operation, uh, he is going to take you through a hands-on lab. So you're going to actually get the opportunity to actually use uh, AI this morning and do some um, uh, image recognition labs. So let's start. As I said, it's very high level. So what is artificial intelligence? Now, as a human, as humans, we learn through experience. We know that if we touch a, uh, a fire, we're gonna get burned, for example. A computer, a program, a piece of code, that does what we tell it to do. We give it a set of instructions and that computer will go off and do exactly what we tell it to do. When we move into the world of artificial intelligence, we're using code, but it's learning. But it's not learning from experience like humans, it's learning from data. So we give our code a whole bunch of data and it learns from it. So you have probably heard of things like AI. You'll have probably heard of terms like machine learning and uh, neural networks and deep learning. These are all different kinds of artificial intelligence, but they all come under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is anything where a um, piece of code or computer mimics human behavior. And then you have subsets. So machine learning is where you use things like models, um, to, to learn, to train and to, to learn how, uh, how things work. And then you get into the world of neural networks and neural networks mimic the structure of, of a human brain. So these, these are all subsets of AI. So, and Pedro's gonna go through some of these um, in a little bit more detail as we go through the session. So let's just take a quick look at an example of how AI works. And we, to do this, we're going to consider muffins and chihuahuas. So when this image first came up, you probably looked at it and for a brief second, you went, oh, hold on a minute, what's going on here? And then you started eyeballing this, this image and you started saying, okay, some of those are dogs, or chihuahuas, because you've learned what a dog looks like and you know, then you suddenly know, okay, that's a dog, oh, and that's a chihuahua. And then you see some of those pictures are muffins and you can say okay that's a muffin and they're raisins and then you start differentiating your brain from the experience of your lifetime starts to um, differentiate which is which through this picture now that's easy for your uh, brain to to very quickly go through that process but it's not as easy for a uh, computer to be able to do that because you think about the process that your brain's gone through. Your brain has gone through not only recognizing what each of those things are, but before you even did that, you had to look at, okay, what's in the foreground, what's in the background? 
what are the colours? What where, where's the what are eyes? What are raisins? Um, so you, you're having to break down this image before you can even start to um, uh, determine what it is. So this is much harder for a computer to do this. So this is where we get into this world of machine learning and how we teach computers to, um, to learn. So what we do is we start with training data. And our training data in this case could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pictures of muffins and chihuahuas. And we've got, we've got this data set that we're using. Then we have models. So for the purpose of this explanation, just think a model is just it's a mathematical model. It's a piece of code. And we will use these models to start learning or, or train these models with the data that we give it, give it. So we move into this training phase. So we take our training data and we may have to uh, clean up this data. We may have to uh, correlate it. We may have to put some tags against some of this, this data. So that in some cases, there's a manipulation, not always, but there's a manipulation of that training data. And um, we will select a model and there's all different model types. And we'll get into this in a little bit of detail later. But we will say, OK, in order to identify a muffin, from a chihuahua and do some image recognition, we're going we're gonna to try this kind of mathematical model. And so we start feeding these pictures um, of muffins and chihuahuas into our model. And the model will come back with a result. And you say, I think this is a muffin. Or it come back and say, I think this is a chihuahua. And we can say correct or fail, right? So we give, we give this feedback. So over time, this model starts to learn and gets more and more accurate in identifying muffins from chihuahuas. And we may, through this process, we may go, that model's not the best model. So we'll we try a different model. But over time, we'll get to a point where we're in the high 90 plus percentage of accuracy when it comes to identifying muffins from chihuahuas from our training data. Now, once we, we get that really high um, accuracy, uh, then we can say, right, we've got a good working model for this particular use case. And then we can deploy our model. So our model has been trained and our model is just, remember, this is just, a, this is a piece of code now that we have and we can deploy that model. And where do we deploy it? Well, it depends, right? That model could be deployed on your phone. Your, the, face, the facial recognition you have to access your phone is, is a model which is doing facial recognition. It could be that I deploy my model in a retail store and I'm monitoring people, uh, recognising uh, different age groups of people walking around the, the store, for example. So I would deploy that and I'd maybe use cameras to, uh, on cameras within my store. But my model is now out in the wild. It's in production and we start feeding in real data into our model. And we will hopefully get the same accuracy rates we get through the training phase that we get in, in real life. And over time, we will update our model. We may retrain it. We will add more capabilities and functionality to, to our model. So like any piece of software, we will consistently update that software um, while it's in, in production. So this, you know, from a very high level, this is um, uh, uh, machine learning. Now, you, have, you may have come across these concepts of supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, the idea um, behind this is we structure the data and we label the data that we give to our models. So through that learning process, that learning process is supervised. Um, so we may label a piece of data to say, OK, this, this is a muffin, this is a... Chihuahua, and as it goes through that learning, it's using those labels to work out if it was correct or not, and we can uh, we can see our accuracy from that. So, if you think about an, an, a use case of, of supervised learning, so if you think about if you were building a model to work out how long it's going to take you to get home from the office, so imagine we're back at offices now, post pandemic, and there's a number of factors which will affect the, your journey time from your office to your home, and that could be what time of day that you, you leave the office, 
what's the weather look like what's the traffic look like so we we have these this data which can be labeled which we can feed into our models and it's looking for forecasting the outcome so to say on a rainy day leaving the office at this kind of um time it's going to take you 20 minutes versus five minutes if you were uh, uh, leaving midday on a sunny day so we can do predictions and classify uh, um, categories now unsupervised learning we don't manipulate the data in the same way we allow the models to look for patterns uh and itself and it builds these patterns into clusters and it's, it's doing it through uh analyzing this data so we're, we're saying go ahead and do it yourself so think of think of for example a baby so if, if you think if you have a baby and you have a family dog you have a pet over time that baby will learn that that is a dog it's not human and it will recognize it as a dog now if your friend comes along and brings their dog you're you don't have to tell the baby that that is a dog because it's, it learns itself, because it's learned itself that dogs have long floppy ears. They have wet noses and they walk on four, four legs. So we don't have to tell the baby like supervised learning that this is a dog. It's learned through its, through its own um, experience, through the data that we've given it. And then we have reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning typically use agents and the, the, the model learns through a series of actions. So to give you an example here, um, if you think of gaming, if you're a gamer, um, some, some games use agents to learn how to move through different levels of a game or even design levels of a game. So your agent will start off, it will walk forward and it will fall off a platform. Think of like Mario, right? Then next time it will start again, it will walk forward. It knows there's a drop at the end of that platform, so it will jump. So it's through a series of actions through reinforcement that it learns um, the, the best course of action. So these, these are the different um, kind, the kinds of learning, which, and the different models fall into these different um, uh, learning categories. Now you can see, we, we can build a model for a specific use case, like muffins versus chihuahuas. But you can start uh, linking different models together for for uh, different use cases. So you can you, you start correlating the output of one model into the output of other models. And you start can start building very powerful use cases using, using uh, multiple AI models. So to give you an example, you're using one right now. So on Cisco WebEx, um, well, you're on YouTube, but we're delivering this over uh, Cisco WebEx, which is a collaboration tool. So and many of our customers use Cisco WebEx and they could be, you know, sitting from home just with a camera with the application running on your phone. You could be like me. I'm actually using a, a WebEx endpoint. So I've got a, it's a Cisco DX, which is a, a 24 inch screen with a built in camera. Now, within WebEx, under the covers, we're using lots of different AI models to deliver this service. So we have things like image recognition. So when I sit down in front of my DX, it recognizes me. It, rec it does a facial recognition. I could say, hey, WebEx, and it's using natural language processing, uh, uh, processing and a little bot will um, come up and I can ask it to start a meeting. I could ask it to find some information on a colleague. And it's, then it's, it's, it's um, uh, linking these different AI models. If we were in a meeting room in a in an office, it could look and actually say you from a camera could say how many people are in that room. And because of covid, we're limiting the number of people within a meeting room. So it starts bringing all of these different capabilities together through different kinds of AI models which are running under the under the covers. And that's just, you know, that's, 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 one use, that's one use case. We've spoken about a few. Industry is using AI all over the place. AI has moved from being uh, what, like science projects and incubation to being widely used across the industry. Now, some industries like media and entertainment have been leading this. So you just think about when you use Netflix or if you're on Amazon, there's recommendation engines. And these are all AI-based on you know your experience so they they work out 
what's your buying patterns, what's your viewing patterns, and they will make recommendations to you based on what uh, the model has learned about you. Then, for example, retail. Uh, from a security perspective within retail, I don't know if you know that using an AI model, I can monitor you walking up and down an aisle. Say, for example, you're in the alcohol aisle in a, in a supermarket. And then based on the way we train the model, we can work out if you're going to buy a bottle of wine or if you're going to steal a bottle of wine. We can also, within the industry, within retail analytics, they look at, they, it's very useful to understand the age groups, the demographics of people in a store at a given time, because then they can maybe do specific advertising to certain age groups within a store. Now, how do you do that? Well, I could have a camera on the doors, but we're not allowed to record people's faces. So what they do is they build a model based on people's shoes because different age groups buy, typically buy different kinds of shoes. So then as people are coming through the doors, we have cameras focused on the shoes and then we can, to a quite a level of accuracy, work out the different age groups of people in the stores at different times of day. And then you've got different examples of in healthcare, you can use models to predict and... Um, uh, like cancer research, for example, use AI models to predict the spread of a pandemic. So there's all these different kind of use cases which are heavily being used by industry, and it's a huge growth area. So if you're interested um, in, you know, in AI and ML, pretty much every sector, every industry is going to be used in AI and ML, in, if not already, uh, more so going forward. So there's the, that's the 30,000 foot view. So I said, um, Pedro has a brains of the organization. So what he's going to do now is he's going to take you through uh, a lab. It would do a bit more introduction, a bit more deeper theory, and then he's going to give you an opportunity to get hands on. So I'll hand over to my esteemed colleague, Pedro Oliveira. Thank you, Raj. Um, and no press now. All right. Okay. So let me quickly show my screen. So hopefully you can see my screen. And like Roger said, my name is Pedro. I work for the developer advocacy team. Um, and today what we're gonna go through, so Roger gave you guys a big 30,000 foot view overview of um, of what is AI and how we can encompass machine learning within AI. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to take you guys through these concepts a little bit deeper. And uh, also, um, we're going to have a hands on workshop as well, where we're going to use image classification uh, and you guys will be able to play with some of these concepts as well. And hopefully um, it can um, excite you guys and excite your ideas. Um, for the hackathon. So, first things first. So, I'm going to take you guys through some of the tools that we're going to be using. And by the way, you don't need to install anything. Everything that we're going to be using, it's um, cloud-based. Um, and we're also going to give you guys the GitHub um, repo uh, that we put together with a workshop. So, you can follow it along as we go through it and as I explain it, or you guys can always come back to it and do it in your own time. Um, all the uh, setup instructions, everything is there, so you guys can just do it as we go along. Okay, so some of the tools that we're going to be doing, and again, I'm going to go, this is just to give you an idea of the different ones we're going to be using. We're going to go a little bit deeper into what they actually are and how, uh, why they're important, but we're going to be using things like Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, you guys might have heard of some of these. Um, they are widely used in machine learning. Um, to develop some of these models and train some of these models. Basically, um, it's where you can run your Python code. So machine learning is very, very Python heavy in the sense that uh, you usually use Python to, to compute your machine uh, learning models. And then we're gonna use something that is called Colab. And this is a tool from Google that they developed uh, a few years ago uh, and it's open source. Uh, everyone can use it, it's free. And that's the one we're going to be using today. That's the one I recommend you guys to use as well. 
Uh, and basically, Colab allows you to run uh, Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud. So instead of you having to run it locally on your machine, you can just run it in the cloud. There's nothing to set up. Everything will be there for you. The other good thing about Colab as well is because it's free, uh, you guys can use it during the hackathon, but you can also use it, you know, in your own free time if you're doing some development. Uh, if you want to play with Python, it's also a very good resource. If you don't want to install Python in your machine and you just want to um, play with Python, you can also do it in Colab, and we'll we'll definitely play with that. And I'll I'll show you um, how to do that. And then we're going to use TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is an open source tool, and we're going to go into uh, more, a little bit more detail later. Um, open source tool from Google. Again, uh, this allows you to build your um, machine learning models. And we're gonna go, we're gonna see how important TensorFlow and uh, it is. And then we have Keras, and Keras is just an API layer that sits on, sits on top of TensorFlow because TensorFlow can be really hard. Um, so we're gonna use Keras, which is high level high level API that sits on top of TensorFlow, and it just makes everything so 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 much easier. And obviously, like I said, we're gonna be using Python. Okay, so. Before we go into a little bit more what Colab is and Keras is and how that is important, I think I'll show you first some of the applications from machine learning. Obviously, Roger already went through some of them. And uh, so, for example, the Chihuahua problem uh, is obviously one of the things that we can do with machine learning. Uh, but one of the things that I like to think, and obviously uh, I, I recommend if you guys uh, want to know more about the subject, to do your own research and, 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 and go ahead. There's so many YouTube videos that you can watch and, and, and books that you can read about it. But um, I like to think about all of these different subjects as AI is, like Roger alluded to, you know, the discipline that is looking at problems that humans are really good at but machines not so much, okay? So we try to make machines to be as good as humans, okay? That's where the artificial intelligence um, name comes from, I would say. So if we're trying to make, for example, a machine being really good at playing chess, okay? So that's one example. And then machine learning is when we go deeper and we, it's just a fancy way of saying we're gonna program with data, like Roger mentioned. So we have a bunch of data and we're gonna program with that data, okay? And then we have neural networks. And uh, neural networks are really good at feature extraction from data, okay? And this will make sense uh, in a second. Now, I'm gonna show you one, well, actually two examples of um, neural networks uh, at work. And this, these are, again, um, open source from, uh, developers at Google and the open source community. So this particular one, and hopefully you can see my screen, uh, is called Media Pipe Hands. And what you can do with this, or what this shows you, is this is actually tracking hands on the screen. So right now there's no hands, so there's no tracking. Uh, and all of a sudden, when I put my hands in, you can see that now this is tracking my hands. And this is really fast, um, and it's it's working pretty well. Obviously, you can play with things like, you know, maximum number of hands. So obviously, if you're expecting more than one person, you can increase that and it will be looking for more than one. And you can also increase the confidence. Okay, so if you, if you really want this to be super confident and make sure that it only tells you when there's hands, then um, you can also play with these things. And Alex will share the all, all these resources for you, for you guys can play along with it, can research it. Like I said, this is open source. Now, the amazing thing about this is this is all done, well, in JavaScript. I'm not a JavaScript develop developer. If anything, I would say I, I do most of my work with uh, Python, but this is done in JavaScript because this is all running on the client side. So why this is important? because none of this is being sent into any server. So all of this is running on my browser, okay? So Google's not receiving my information, uh, AWS or none, none of the cloud providers uh, are receiving my information. All of this is run on the browser. And this is really important. Now, the difference, 
the, the reason why this is important is because if you want to go and develop this with Python, for example, then you'd have to do most of this on the server side. Okay. So if you have some JavaScript friends or friends that uh, code in JavaScript, this might be a very good one for them to have a look and for you to develop something that you um, that you can do with this. Now, another very cool one, and I think this one is the one that most of us can relate to, is a uh, one that is called Face Mesh. So let me just refresh this. Actually, this might not work because I'm already using my camera. So let me very quickly stop my camera, see if that works. Because I think this might be really good. Okay. So let's see if this comes through. If it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. Okay, that's because I'm on WebEx um, and it doesn't let me use my camera twice on different pro applications. But you guys uh, go ahead. Uh, you can uh, you can play with it yourself. And basically, this is a face face mesh application. So same way we were doing with the hands, this is tracking face, and you'll be able to see literally all the different vectors across your face, including the lips and the eyes. Uh, and this is tracking all the movements. So and again, it's all done on the client side, so it's all running on your browser. So it's not sent, your face is not being sent anywhere. And if you start to think of, you know, where is this application being used, for example, or something similar, um, everyone is now familiar with things like Face ID. So Face ID does something similar, it, it meshes your face and it recognizes you. So here we're doing something similar, uh, but we are also tracking the face. So applications around like, for example, uh, Roger mentioned that AI is very cross um, discipline. So, if you start to think about some of the applications around the medical area, so for example, someone that is uh, physically incapacitated uh, or that he cannot move, doesn't have really uh, a lot of movement that they can that they can do, you can start developing applications where you track their faces, and even when they blink, um, you can do actions with that as well. So face mesh, if you can Google it, uh, you will be able to find it and you can play it, play with it yourself as well. And if you want to build on top of it, uh, you can, because this is project, this project is completely open source. Uh, you can, you can build, build your own applications on top of it. Okay. So with some of those uh, out of the way, we can start going into into a little bit deeper into what we're going to do today. And uh, along the way, I'll, I'll, I'll show you um, some more examples as well. Um, some of them might have some drawings uh, in the mix. Um, by the way, full disclaimer, I'm not good at drawing, um, but we'll, uh, we'll see when we get there. Okay. So, uh, like I said, Google Cura Colab is the one that we're going to be using. It uh, stands for collaboratory. Again, uh, it's free. The, Really good thing about this is that you get a free GPU. Well, it's a shared pool of memory, but you do get uh, some GPU resources for free. Uh, for the lab that we're going to do today or the workshop that we're going to do today, you don't need a GPU, not at all. Uh, but if you're starting uh, with machine learning and playing with some uh, some of the data and, and some if you're doing uh, Im image classification, GPU is important and, you know, here, it's free. Uh, you don't need to uh, buy anything, and especially in these uh, this climate, the GPUs are really expensive. So uh, it's a very good pro. And again, TensorFlow comes installed by default, so there's not, nothing really that you need to install. And the really good thing as well is it integrates natively with GitHub. So everything that you do there, you can automatically push into GitHub, and it saves all your, all your um, notebooks, your Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. So you can share it with other people uh, and you can have it saved there as well for free, obviously. Okay. So TensorFlow. TensorFlow, uh, like I mentioned, is, a, is an open sor source tool. Uh, it's a machine learning framework from Google. Uh, they developed it um, years, a few years ago. Uh, it's, it powers pretty much all the projects, uh, ML projects at Google, so, you know, quite, um, quite powerful. 
um, and it has amazing community backing. And that's one of the reasons why we're showing uh, you this as, as well. It's because uh, it does have uh, more than a thousand, I think close to 2000 now uh, active uh, non Google contributors. So there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort into this. Uh, and again, obviously it runs in Python is the one that we're going to use, but also JavaScript. So the examples that I've shown you were using TensorFlow JavaScript uh, running on the browser. And it's powered by C++ backend, but we don't really need to worry about that. Okay, so we spoke about TensorFlow, but you know, what is a tensor? Um, and, and this is important because everything TensorFlow is essentially a tensor. So uh, that's what we're going to be using. And tensor is nothing more than arrays. Okay, so it's a, an n-dimensional array. And obviously, zero order will be something like uh, you have a number there. And if you're familiar with something like Python or even Java or any programming language, the first order array will be either an array or a list. And then second order array starts to look like something like a matrix um, in, in maths. And then third order plus things start to become complicated. So basically, just n-dimensional array, that's what tensor means. And usually, obviously, it's when you have a tensor in TensorFlow, you have name, a shape, and a type. And the type could be usually an integer, which is a whole number, or a float, which would be damage, uh, which would be, sorry, uh, fractional numbers. And we'll see this in the, in the hands-on. We'll, we'll print um, some of the data types, and you'll be able to see uh, what they look like. Okay, so Keras, this is um, the last one of the tooling before we uh, we move forward. So again, like I said, very high level um, neural network API. Funny enough, it was, and I guess this is a fun fact, uh, it was one of the uh, developers from TensorFlow. Uh, he left Google and he decided to create something that uh, would go on top of uh, TensorFlow because TensorFlow was too hard to use. So he decided to develop this high-level API on top of TensorFlow and he created Keras. Uh, and now Keras is again open source just like uh, TensorFlow and it makes TensorFlow agrees, agrees to work with. And we'll see um, we'll see that in, in just a few a few minutes. And again it's written in Python uh, which helps even further because most of the work that we do and most of the work that machine learning engineers <clears throat> and data scientists use this Python as well. Okay, so moving forward, um, I'm gonna go through some of the concepts. Um, and I like to say that machine learning is, or tends to be, concept heavy and code light. So, and, and you see this now, so most of the, we, we're not gonna be using hundreds and, and hundreds of lines of code. We're actually gonna be using fairly small um, code, um, lines of code. And, but the concepts is, it, are, each, are actually quite um, complicated uh, in a way. And we're gonna try to break those down for you because I think it's important to understand what's going on. Um, and, and here, so Roger introduced the concept of machine learning, and he also introduced, obviously, the concept of deep learning. But there's, uh, there's a fundamental difference between them. And the biggest difference uh, is the feature extraction, as you can see on the picture. And um, this is because uh, with machine learning, and we're talking about, I don't want to get too specific here, but we're talking about things like logistic regression, um, or decision trees, you need to do feature extraction, okay? Um, and that, that takes time, right? That takes time, and um, but it's, it's super powerful, okay? Now, with deep learning, we don't do feature extraction because the neural networks will do the feature extraction for us, okay? So it becomes a little bit more, more complicated, but um, it does save us some time. Okay, so when we do feature extraction, we are using our own time. Uh, when we're doing deep learning to do feature extraction for us, uh, we are spending computational time. And I like to think that we value our time a lot more than we value computational time. So um, 
uh, deep learning kind of comes on top. Of course, there are still a lot of problems that deep learning um, will be too complex to solve, and we still use obviously machine learning and feature extraction, uh, but deep learning does help a lot um, with feature extraction. And this is where, I guess, it's good to introduce the concept of structured data versus unstructured data. So there's these two concepts um, that we use in machine learning, and structured data is anything that you can put into a CSV file or a spreadsheet. Okay, so think about geographical data, census data, uh, now that everyone has been uh, filling up their census. Uh, so that's, let's say, structured data. Okay, and from structured data is really easy, easy to do feature extraction given the time. Now, we also have unstructured data, and that's when it becomes complicated to extract features from unstructured data because we're looking at things like pictures, voice recordings, graphs, okay? So these are, the data here is unstructured. So we need or to extract features from this data um, from a, a, comp a computational point of view, um, it's, it's harder, right? So, and that's why we use uh, deep learning for unstructured data, and usually for structured data, you use machine learning. Okay, and then there's a um, first time I read that, I, I actually I probably giggled a little bit too much than I should have, but uh, just a bit of humor never hurts nobody. Okay, now um, let's go a little bit deeper into what so we we're talking about uh, deep learning and neural networks now what is a neuron and roger mentioned uh, that you know obviously the neural networks kind of tend to mimic the the human brain and to some some extent obviously that is true to a high, very high level that is true as you go deeper um it becomes evident that it's there's a, a bit of a distinction but here you can see that this is a neutron is basically a node that takes a bunch of inputs with a bunch of weights. So our inputs are the X1, uh, X2, Xi, whatever. And then the weight is the W. And all of this gets computed, uh, computed into a node. And then this node then gets excited by a function. Okay, And we're going to call this an activation function. And we're going to see this later. How does that work? And this activation function can take many shapes. And um, one can argue that every six months, there's someone that comes up with a new activation function. So there's like a paper released, and they are, they, everyone is arguing if that activation function is better or not. And then in the industry then decides if it is or if it isn't, if people start using it or not. OK? But in simplistic terms, uh, this this is what it is, and to be fair, it doesn't really get much more complicated than that. Now the network. So we've been speaking about deep learning um, neural networks. So we have on the left a single neural network. Okay, so that's an NN, let's say neural network, and then on the right we have a deep learning uh, neural network because we have more than one layer. So if you have one hidden layer as a neural network. If we have several, we have deep learning um, neural networks because the network gets deeper. Okay, so the more layers you have, the deeper your network is. Okay, and usually, obviously, you have an input and an output, and we'll see how um, how that changes and what kind of inputs and outputs you can have. Okay, and then this is a, a Deep uh, neural network. Uh, I like to think everything is easier with cats and dogs or with animals. So here you can see we have two labeled photos. Uh, again, photos are unstructured data, uh, so just pixels, right? And this is our input to our uh, neural network. And then uh, this goes through a bunch of hidden layers, as you can see. And then we have an output. And the output is going to be is it a cat, is it a dog? Okay. And there's going to be some errors in between, some loss, and we're going to go through uh, what that means and how you can train your network to be really good at detecting 
cats or dogs or whatever you're trying to detect. Pedro, just uh, yes. one question yeah. up is, can you just clarify Perfect. what feature extraction is? Yes, um, I can. So if we go back, so we're gonna we're gonna go deeper into this actually um, later on when we're doing the hands-on, uh, and I'll I'll explain exactly. Uh, we'll see exactly uh, what kind of feature features the the neural network is extracting. So like I said, uh, just briefly and, and trying to recap. Uh, when we're talking about machine learning, uh, and we have structured data, we're looking at things like, let's say, uh, geographical data. Okay, so how many people live in an area? What's their age? What's their gender? Uh, are they married? Are they single? Um, you know, um, what's their income? Things like that. So that's that's uh, structured data, and those are features. Okay from that data. Now, when we look at deep learning and we look at um, images, for example, let's take, let's take the image of a, of a cat and a dog. So this is unstructured data, right? Because picture is just pixels. Um, now, if we're looking at feature extraction, we need to extract features from every single picture and try to make sense of it. So if we were trying to do this without deep learning or without neural networks, you'd have to look at every pixel and you'd have to be like, is pix a pixel severed um, bigger than pixel 100? Okay, and then you'd, you'd have to do all this correlation, which is, uh, it's possible, but it's insane. It, it would take too long. Now with deep neural networks, what we can do is we can do, we can develop a, a, a model that learns features and shapes and patterns from unstructured data and from, let's say, a picture of a cat, your neural network can work out, you know, features like uh, ears and eyes and a mouth and fur um, and things like that. And, and it can do that automatically as we go along. So that's the feature extraction from a, a neural network. But again, we're going to go deeper uh, into that. Uh, on the hands-on. So what, what we're actually going to do in the hands-on bit is I'm going to show you how to develop a, a neural network and then a deep neural network. And we're going to go through kind of step by step what's happening um, and where is the feature extraction coming from. Um, and hopefully that will make a little bit more sense. But yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And I hope um, that answered your question. And if not, hopefully the next bit will. Okay, so like I said, the hands-on workshop that we're going to do, um, it's on GitHub, and you guys can either follow along with me as well. We're going to use Google Colab, and um, I'll show you how to how to get to that. And again, yeah, you can you can do it with uh, me at the same time, or you can just listen to me and do it later on. Uh, it's going to be there for you. Again, it's all free. You don't need to. Uh, use your local machine or anything. Um, there's also a, a QR code, so if you want to um, open it on your phone or something like that, just uh, point your camera to it and you should be able to see the link as well. And uh, I believe Alex is going to share the link with you, um, so you can you can uh, start following from that. But before, uh, first things first, I'll explain what we're going to do, um, and then we'll go into, <clears throat> we're going to go into the, the uh, the hands on bit. Okay, let me just see how we're doing for time. Okay, so we should be good. We have about 45 minutes, which is uh, pretty good. Okay, so we're going to be using the fashion MNIST uh, from the machine learning world and um, if you're not familiar, so there's a, a data set which is called MNIST, and this is the hell of world of machine learning. But this data set has been beaten up for years and years and years, and it's basically just a, a data set of handwritten numbers between zero and nine. Okay, and this is not you know particularly exciting, 
um, at least I, I don't think it's particularly exciting. Um, so I think the function MNIST, which was created afterwards, um, is a bunch of, it's a data set from uh, a bunch of uh, pictures of clothing from Zalando, um, if you guys are familiar with, and if you shop there. Um, and it has uh, 10 classes or 10 categories. And as you can see here, uh, there's the, the categories vary between is it pants, is it a sweatshirt, is it a t-shirt, is it sandals, is it a handbag, is it boots, uh, things like that. And we'll see, we'll see that on the hands-on every single uh, class. And these are, this is a fairly small in size, a fairly small data set because these are grayscale images. So there's no, um, there's no color and they're 20, 20 by 28 pixel images as well. Okay, so they're fairly small, which means that we can train our models pretty fast. And we have 60,000 of them. Uh, so there's, uh, well, actually in total, there's 70,000 of these pictures. And we're gonna use 60,000 of them to train our model. And we're gonna reserve 10,000 to test our model with. So the 60,000 for training the model is the one that the model is gonna constantly see, obviously, as it, as it learns. And then the 10,000 pictures that we separate are the ones that the model would have never seen. So they will be fresh, and that's how we uh, test the model is with pictures that it hasn't seen before. And we'll, we'll make sense of why that is important in a second. And again, if you want to research what MNIST is, uh, you, can, you can look for the original one as well, but it's just a bunch of pictures with zeros uh, from zero to nine. Okay, so first things first, um, actually, I'm going to show you how we can access all of this because it's much easier if I do that. So, uh, wrong. There we go. Okay, we can close this and we can close this. So, um, if you guys want to go to Colab, uh, you, you don't need to do this now, by the way, um, because you, you can access Colab from the GitHub repo. But um, if you separate from the GitHub repo that we're going to be using, uh, if you just want to go and explore Colab separately, you can just go to colab.research.google.com. And all you need is your Gmail or Google account, which I'm assuming pretty much everyone has one. Um, and you can just use it. Okay, you can even uh, copy to Drive. You can use Google Drive, Google Docs, and like I said, GitHub as well. But yeah, we, we're going to be coming into Colab directly from the GitHub repo. This is just to show you guys how you can access it. Um, externally from the repo. Okay. So hopefully everyone has hopefully everyone has access to the GitHub repo. And here, so the, the repo is called image classification workshop. Uh, and we have basically there's two ways you can deploy this. Uh, the main one is the one we're going to be using today is we're going to be using Google Colab. And again, the link is here. So if you click there, it takes you to the generic uh, colab.research.google.com. Uh, but the one we're going to be, the, the really good thing about this is we can launch Colab from GitHub. So if you guys are on the main page uh, from GitHub, you can uh, just scroll down a little bit and where it click, says click here to start, uh, you can click there. Uh, I'm going to click there, but I have this preloaded. Okay, uh, that works too. So that's going to take you to our first model. Uh, okay, so we have four models. Uh, in essence, the data is always the same. The models will change based on the parameters that we're going to tune. Uh, and like I said, you can open this automatically in Colab. So at the top of every model, Obviously, everything is here explained and uh, you can go through it uh, as we're going to go through now. But at the top, uh, there's a button that says open in Colab. And if you press there, you should be you should be able to see uh, the model open in Colab. OK, so hopefully everyone is able to do that. Now, what I'm going to do and I, I um, advise you guys to do the same. Is so when we load the model, um, it preloads with all the outputs from when I push this into GitHub, which is not what we want because we want to rerun the model, right? Um, so what I recommend is if you guys go to 
if you guys go to edit, there's a, a an option that says clear all outputs. So just go to edit and then press clear all outputs and this clears every single thing. And now the model is essentially bare. So for us to start and play with. Okay, now, like I said, with, with Colab, we have access to um, Jupyter Notebook. We just have to make sure that we connect. So you can go ahead and click connect. Uh, that will uh, allow you to connect. So let me just sign in, which I didn't. Yeah. Actually, let me. Actually, let me use Safari instead. So just bear with me one second. And hopefully that will make things much easier for us. Okay. So as I was saying, and sorry about that. So we need to connect. So hopefully we, you guys have done an edit, clear all outputs with that, and then we can connect. So the reason why we need to connect is because when you use Colab to run a Jupyter Notebook, you need some uh, resources. So you connect and Google gives you free resources. Uh, so we can connect. Uh, it, it takes about 30 seconds or so, and you'll be able to see uh, the resources that Google give you, and you can see some RAM and disk. Uh, the other thing, like I said, is you get access to um, to a GPU, uh, which is it gives uh, Google gives it to you by default. In this particular case, we don't need a GPU. So if you guys want, you can go to runtime, uh, manage session, or ch actually change runtime type and click none. If you want to use a GPU, uh, you can just leave it. Let's leave it for now. It makes, in this particular case, the training slightly quicker, but that's just slightly. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run this uh, thing in its entirety, just because the training is going to take a while. So as I explained, hopefully the training will be done by then. So what you guys can do as well uh, is you can you can do a runtime run all. So what this does is it runs. So every single thing in Jupyter Notebooks is a cell. So every cell is gonna when you press run all, every single cell is gonna run sequentially, right? So that's what we're gonna do. And you might receive this, uh, and you just say run anyway because I promise I haven't done anything dodgy on my GitHub. So you guys should play, press play, and now you'll be able to see some of the outputs. So you can, like I said, you can either do run all or you can run sequentially. So if you want to run sequentially yourself or manually, you can just press play as we go along and that will rerun um, the cell for you. So if I press play here, it will. Like I mentioned, we are um, using Fashion MNIST 20 by 20 pixels uh, of 70,000. Um, images data set and first thing that we do is obviously we load um, tensorflow so this is the code that we do to to load tensorflow into the jupyter notebook uh, again you don't need to install it you just import it, it comes natively from colab and we're also using uh, things like numpy and matplot uh, this is literally um, open source packages that we're using numpy for computational purposes it makes multiplying matrices really, really fast in Python, and matplotlib is just to allow us to plot um, uh, plots and graphs, so it's easier to visualize. Okay, so first things first, what we do is Fashion MNIST comes native to Keras, so what we're going to do is we're going to load that data set, so we can load directly by using the Keras API. Uh, like I said, it makes it super, super easy to use. So all we do is keras.datasets, function MNIST, boom, done. We have the function MNIST loaded in our Jupyter Notebook. 
Perfect. And you can see here that it's been long downloaded um, from Google. Um, and then what we do is we're gonna we have to separate the data, right? So and this is basically basic data processing. So what we're saying is, okay, we have uh, trained images, trained labels, uh, and we have test images and test labels. Okay, so for uh, for this kind of for image classification, all the data that you um, input has to be labeled, right? So the model needs to know. <clears throat> or, or, or it needs to work out as it trains, it needs to work out, uh, obviously, you know, is it a bag, is it not a bag, but in, this needs to be labeled um, so that it knows. Uh, so we need, we need these labels. So that's why we have images, labels, images, labels. And we can see here um, as well, like I said, we're going to have, we have 10 classes and it starts so the the way we give the model classes is um, just by doing this. Okay, so we we actually giving classes a name just because for us to be easy to understand. But obviously in the model, the classes will be uh, numbers from zero to ten. Oh, sorry, from zero to nine. But let's name them as well, so then we can um, output it in an easier way. And again. Um, you guys can do this sequentially and one by one, and you can read all the all the explanation uh, later later on as well. But all we're doing here is loading the data. So we loaded the, the seventy thousand uh, data the pictures data set. We separated that data set into uh, training model, training data and testing data. And now we uh, we created some labels, and, and now we're giving it names. And now, one of the things that I would write, always recommend you guys to do is to always uh, look at the shapes of your data. And this helps because uh, this is really good for debugging. So in this particular case, I'm checking for, okay, my trained images, how big are my trained images, and what's the shape? Okay, and here we can see we have 60,000 trained images, which is what we said we would have, and they are 28 by 28 pixels, which makes sense. And then, okay, let's um, have a look at the training labels. And um, training labels, uh, as we see here, it's an array or a list. Uh, if you come from the Python world, and you can see here they're all from zero to nine. So what this tells us is the first, uh, the first image is a nine, which is an ankle boot, and the last image is a five, which is a sandal. Okay, and uh, that makes sense. And again, we do the same for the test images, and it makes sense because we said 60,000 for training, 10,000 for testing, and that makes sense. So it's the same. Okay, so now then <clears throat> I'm just uh, very quickly, again, we're going to do some pre-processing of the data. And this is because uh, for neural networks, uh, so here pixels uh, vary from 0 to 255, okay? so. Um, eight bits. If if you come if you uh, come from that side of the world, uh, zero to two fifty five that means eight bit, and this is what um, every pixel uh, will be. So it will be numbered from zero to two fifty five. Uh, but for machine learning uh, or for neural networks in this particular case, we know that they work better, especially for image classification. They work better if all these pixels are resized from zero to one instead of. Uh, 0 to 255 and so that's what we do so and here all i'm doing is i'm showing you okay this is a pixel that varies from 0 to 255 and you can see here uh how, how it changes color based on the number of the pixel and then what i'm doing here is i'm normalizing it and i'm saying okay i want all my images to be between 0 and 1 and not 0 and 255 that's what i do so basically uh i I just resize everything. So the train images and the test images, obviously they need to be the same. So I just normalize them from, so that they all are between zero and one, and then I print them. Okay, and what I'm gonna show you next is here is a picture of the data before it's normalized. And here is a picture of the data after it's normalized. And you see that there's barely any difference. Okay, uh, and you can see here now that the pixels are between zero and one not zero and 255. 
And again, this is no machine learning, just data pre-processing. And we're just doing this because this is a problem <laughs> that's been um, solved many times over and we know what works. So we know that this works very well. Okay, and then what I'm doing is then I'm just printing um, some of the images as well. So I'm gonna print um, the first 25 images and you guys can see, and these are all normalized and you guys can see that we can still tell what they are. So we see some sneakers, some sandals, some coats, some shirts, some bags, and so on. Okay, so this is the pre-processing uh, all done. And we have half an hour to cover the rest. So we might need to speed things up a little bit, but we should be okay. Now, we're gonna build this model uh, using the Keras API. So let me go back to my presentation, making sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, so just for, for you to kind of visualize what we're doing. So we have uh, the data set, which we already inputted. Then we do some pre-processing, which is all the um, adding the labels uh, or the class names, then normalizing it and doing all of that stuff. So that's the pre-processing bit, which is what we've done. So we've done this step and this step. Now we're gonna build the model. So, and we're gonna do that using Keras. Okay. So let me show you what we do there. And again, as you guys can see, we haven't really done much code. It's a lot of concepts. So like I said, code light, concept heavy. Um, and to prove that, you know, you can, you can tell, you can code a model in three lines of code. So that's literally what we did here, okay? Um, but again, the concepts behind it, <laughs> uh, it's, another topic altogether and we're going to go through those topics now so here we're going to build a model using the keras api so we're going to use the sequential api and i would say for 95 percent of the problems that you will ever um solve in in machine learning on your networks you'll probably end up using the sequential api um, there's others like functional and so on but we're not going to cover those um and sequential just means um, because the layers, are, or in a neural network, the layers are sequential and hierarchical, and you have a stack of layers, and that's why it's called a sequential API. So, first things first, obviously, we define the model, and then we call the sequential API, and the first layer is what we call a flatten. So, th there's no machine learning here whatsoever. Uh, again, I would say this is like another step of pre-processing. And the reason why this is pre we need to do a flatten, what this means is we're going to convert those 2D images, right, 28 by 28, into one vector. And the reason why we convert it into a 1D vector is because the dense layers underneath uh, only take vectors. That's one of the um, uh, restrictions of using dense layers. But we don't lose any information about the picture. We just lose some information about the 2D structure, which in this case makes no difference whatsoever. So uh, that's what we that's what we do here. We just flatten. So we go from 2D 28 28 pixels to a 1D 784 uh, vector. So 28 times 28 784. That's what we have here. And then we apply our first dense layer. Okay. So the first layer, and hopefully I'll, I'll make it easy to understand in the next um, in the next slide when I'll show you. Um, basically, in this dense layer, we have a concept of uh, neurons. So we I already showed you guys what, what a neuron is. So we'll have 128 neurons, and that's one layer. So we'll have one layer, 128 neurons. Now, the 128 number is literally pulled out of a hat. Okay, so you could put 300, could put 1,000, could put 10,000, doesn't really matter. It just, just means, well, it does matter <laughs> in the end, but it just means that you're going to have, for example, 10,000 neurons instead of 128. Here, we're using powers of two uh, because, well, I, I come from an engineering background, so powers of two make sense to me. 
Um, so I usually use powers of two, so I'm using 120, but you can use 150, it doesn't matter. And I do recommend that you try your own number and see what you get. So here we are starting with 128. Again, machine learning is a lot of trial by error as well. So as you go along, there's no one that will ever look at, at a problem and it will say, you know what, uh, a 128 layer a neural network uh, is gonna, sorry, 128 uh, neurons with one layer neural networks are gonna solve this specific problem. Uh, that, that's not gonna happen. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. And in this particular case, again, you know, this will potentially work because this is a very well-known problem. Um, so we just use 128 neurons and one layer. And then the second layer is uh, it's our output layer. And in this one, uh, we have, you can see here, we'll have, we have 10 classes. So you can only have 10 possible outputs, right? So it's either um, a boot, uh, t-shirt, shirt, etc. So that's why we have 10 here. Okay, so you always have 10 as your last layer because that's what um, the output. And here we use softmax um, and again, I'll go into uh, a little bit of detail, but softmax just does uh, the probability distribution um, of your output. So basically what happens is, let's say you evaluate one picture um, and that picture goes through your model. And then at the end on these 10, um, on these 10 neurons, you will have, each one of them will have a value between um, zero and one, sorry, yeah, between zero and one. And uh, that will be the prob uh, probability of that value being whatever image, right? And the sum of all of those will equate to one. And hopefully that will make sense when we go deeper just now, not too deep. Okay, so let's have a look at inside the neural network. And um, I hope that makes more sense. So, and here, I hope we also um, explain the feature extraction question, because this is where things get really interesting. Now, we have, like I said, uh, we have 28 by 28, but here we have to flatten. Okay, so here are the pixel values that are flattened. So imagine here we would have 784. Okay, and then here we're gonna have our first layer of neurons. Okay, and the first layer we, we chose to be 128. So here we were gonna have 128 neurons. And every and you see that this is a fully mesh network, so which means that every single neuron is connected to all uh, the bases. Okay, and we have this fully meshed network. So when we talk about feature extraction and the reason why neural networks are really important or are really powerful is because the first layer is going to be in charge of extracting one feature. And the first feature is going to be, let's say, edges. So the first neural network, so sorry, the first layer is going to look at it and it's going to be responsible for identifying edges. Okay. And then the second one, if we were to add a second one with the same amount of neurons or less, doesn't matter, uh, this is now going to take those shapes. Okay, so it's going to take this, the output of the first layer, which are shapes, uh, sorry, which are edges, and then it's going to identify shapes. Okay, and then if we stop there, okay, we then going to use those shapes from the second layer to then identify the output. And so we're going to identify if it's a shirt, if it's a sweatshirt, uh, if it's a boot, if it's an ankle boot, uh, by looking at the shapes from the second layer. Okay. So the neural network or the deep neural network, depending on how many layers you have, is really good at extracting features in this hierarchical. And what this means is um, the first one, as you go deeper, the first one will identify, so we start with pixels, right? And then the first one is going to identify edges. The second one is going to identify shapes. The third one is going to identify patterns. God knows what's, what the tenth one, tenth one is going to identify, right? But this is usually how it goes, okay? And this is how you extract the features. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, 
the other thing that we should kind of hopefully uh, make sense is the width and the height. So the more, um, the deeper your network is, um, the more features you will extract, right? Um, and the width is just going to be patterns of those features, right? So the more neural, uh, the more neurons you have, the bigger the capability of you extracting more features um, from a particular um, shape, for example, right? So let's say you have uh, one of the one of them are doing shapes. You have 128 neurons doing just shapes, and the other one is going to be 128 neurons doing just edges and things like that. Okay, and again, this is all trial and error. Uh, as you go along, as you're trying to solve and build your model, uh, you will learn and you will identify what are the best hyperparameters. So the number of neurons, the number of layers, these are all hyperparameters, uh, and these are tunable parameters that you will go and trial and error. Okay, so we're gonna skip this a little bit just because we don't have much time and I want to cover a little bit more. But basically, this just goes through um, how, and, and we, we can share the uh, these slides later on, but basically, this just goes through uh, kind of step-by-step step what happens. And um, here, I just want to um, show you guys that you have the inputs, and these are the pixels, right? Uh, you multiply those pixels by weights, and the weights are always ran randomly generated. Okay, and then you have the summation of, of this multiplication, and then you have an activation function. And the activation function is a nonlinear function, and it has to be nonlinear because this is what allows the neurons to learn something. Okay, if the activation function is nonlinear, and or if the activation function is linear, then the neurons won't learn anything valuable. Okay, and I'm not going to go into why that is because there's a lot of maths behind it, but just take that for granted. So the activation function needs to be non-linear. That's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of uh, activation functions. The one we're going to be using is ReLU. Uh, it's called ReLU, but basically just means that if the value is um, negative, make it zero. If it's uh, positive, um, pass it unchanged. And I know this is a bit not not very intuitive, um, but this is how neurons learn features. So here, for example, you guys can see um, if this is just an example. So we have two inputs, um, and you can see here. So that, for example, uh, by multiplying the weights, um, one is positive, one is negative. Then we apply value, and one is going to go and change, and the one is, is zero. Basically, that's what it is. Again, I just want you guys to understand that we add a nonlinearity activation function just so that the neuron is able to learn. Okay, don't worry too much about the math. TensorFlow and Keras can do all of that for you. Okay, so I know that was a lot and I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you're still with us. And if not, you can always go back and read through it and learn through it. Um, so once we build the model, so with Keras, uh, there's three steps. So we build the model, we compile the model, and we train the model. There's, those are the three steps. So we just build the model, and here uh, we build the model with uh, one layer. So this is a neural network. Now, magic, I want to make it a deep neural network. Okay, I just add another uh, layer. This is how you go from a neural network to a deep neural network. If you want to have an even deeper neural network, you add another layer. Okay, so the expense of this is obviously it will take longer for you to train the model. Okay, that's the trade off. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And again, you, you can play with this and, and do this yourself, right? And see what kind of outputs uh, you, you will get later on. Now, we compile the model, and when we compile the model, uh, we're not going to go too much in detail with this, but basically you have an optimizer uh, that you have to specify, uh, and this just optimizes the loss function, and the loss is basically the error. So every time 
you compute your model and you train your model, uh, there's going to be an error, right? Because you know what the output should be and you look at what the output is, there's an error there, and you compute the, the loss and you all you're trying to do is minimize that loss, right? So if you guys want to go deeper for now, just uh, take this for granted. Uh, this is what, what we're going to be using. If you want to go deeper into these concepts, um, you can look at uh, this Google uh, or, or YouTube is, is a really good resource, but Google has a, a crash course, machine learning crash course. So if you literally Google machine learning crash course from Google, uh, you'll see uh, there's a, a crash course that goes through all of these concepts in a lot of detail. But for now, take that for granted. Now, what we're going to do is so we, like I said, three steps. So we build the model. We compiled it now we trained it okay so when we train it we just do model.fit okay so we have train images train labels and then we have this um another hyperparameter which is called epochs and epochs it's just it just means um how many times are you going to run or how many times are you going to train your model with that data so in this particular case we have sixty thousand um images that we train so 10 epochs just means that our model is going to go through those images those 60,000 images 10 times okay and it's going to learn and try to become better every time it goes through okay so epochs now epochs there's a there's a right value for it and it's your job to find it so th if if anything this is you tune everything kind of around this value Right, so and it will make sense as we go along. But basically, here uh, again, we start with random, um, almost like we are a machine learning model ourselves. So we say, okay, let's start with ten, uh, and we say, okay, let's run this uh, ten times, and we see here that the loss decreases, which is good uh, as as it goes along, and the accuracy increases, which is good. So it means that our model hopefully is learning. Uh, those features and it's learning to identify um, those pictures. Okay, so then we've used here uh, 60,000 images. If you guys remember, we have 10,000 images left that the model hasn't seen yet, okay, which is the testing data. And what we do is we evaluate the module at the end. And what we say is, okay, let's take these 10,000 images that the model has never seen and let's see how well the model does with that data. Okay, with the unseen data. Now, when we do that, the accuracy is slightly less. Okay, so we here we're saying, okay, um, let's evaluate the model with test images and test labels, uh, and we're going to output the test loss and the test accuracy. And we're saying, okay, the loss is slightly higher, considerably higher than the training loss, and the accuracy is slightly lower as well. So what that means is our model is really good on the training set, or it seems to be really good on the training set, but it doesn't seem to be so good on the testing set. And this is a classical machine learning problem or a classical um, deep uh, neural network problem, which is overfitting, underfitting um, models. And here we seem to be overfitting. So in machine learning, um, there's uh, a, a massive tension between um, making sure that your model has or learns just enough features so that it's able to generalize. Okay, so you don't want your model to know exactly what the sweatshirt on your training model looks like because you want your model to go and be able to identify all the sweatshirts in the world, right? So it has to be able to generalize. Okay, and this is probably it's a classical machine learning problem. And it's, this is the problem you'll be trying to solve as you build your models. So you want it to generalize. So if we go back here, um, we can see, we can see that um, we need to take some steps, okay, to make sure that our model is able to generalize. Okay, let's see how we're doing with time. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. So there's another concept which is called um, convolution. So before we go into making sure 
you overfit or underfit your model. There's another thing that I wanted to uh, introduce very quickly. So let me stop this one. Oh, actually, let's just, just do it for now. Yeah. And so if you go to model two, so model two is basically the same thing uh, as model one. So we go through the pre-processing, um, but now what we're doing is we're using convolution layers. And I want to go, I want to spend five minutes just going through these convolution layers because this is very important for image processing. And convolution uh, neural networks, uh, basically it just adds pre-processing to, or more processing to the data, okay? Before you go through those dense layers. Um, and this is uh, machine learning, so it's, it's just not pre-processing. Uh, but what we're doing is, is essentially we adding convolutions just means filters, okay? So if, of course, everyone is familiar with Instagram filters and um, Instagram filters is kind of like adding, it's kind of making a convolution of your original picture. And the reason why we use convolutions is again, for feature extraction. So what we're doing is we literally <laughs> applying a filter to an image, which is again, um, matrix multiplication, um, and we're able to extract features better. So for example, with this filter, uh, we can see that after we apply that filter, we are able to identify visually um, vertical edges. Okay, so when this goes through our neural network, we know our neural network uh, will be able to identify vertical edges much better. And again, we try another filter, and at this time, we can see that this filter is able to identify our horizontal edges, right? And there's a bunch and bunch and bunch of filters uh, that you can apply filters for uh, fingers, fingernails, eyes, hair, etc. And and we, you can apply all these filters to all your images so that your neural networks is even better at extracting features. So. One thing is when we use convolution, we also need to use something that is called pooling. And pooling just means compression. Again, don't want to go too much uh, in too much detail, but basically what we do is um, you compress the image um, so that it, it doesn't lose as much information. Uh, and it, it's pretty much the same image, but just compressed. Well, that's what compressing means. And the, this is important because let's say if you're using 32 filters in your image, you will have your image now 32 times. So your, <clears throat> your model will be 32 times at least bigger. And uh, that will slow things down uh, a lot. So you use pooling to decrease um, and to compress those images so they're much smaller. And you can see here that barely anything changes. So what we do here, we take the filtered image that we saw before, and we apply apply compression, and you you know the shapes, which is what we're trying to identify, are still there. Okay. So this is all good. Okay. So this is basically what this does. What this model two does is it goes uh, it goes away and it um, okay. Sorry, I just need to terminate one of my sessions. So this model two basically just uses what we built before, which was those dense layers and it applies a convolutional layer before. So you see here, this is the same. I just added more neurons just because I felt like, uh, okay, let's try more neurons. And before now we have a convolution layer and a max pooling layer. So basically we have one convolution layer that uses 32 filters. And again, we excite with ReLU. And again, um, just take that for granted for now. And we know the pictures are 28 by 28. And then we, we use max pooling um, to keep those pictures compressed and small. Um, and that's how you add a convolution layer. If you wanna add more convolution layers or further convolution layers, just copy and paste, same as before and you'll add more convolution layers. At the end, again, before you, these will process the pictures in 2D, right? And then before we go into the dense layers, 
you need to flatten it because again, we need it to be a vector. Flatten it and then you go through that. Uh, once again, again, these layers are now using the features extracted from the convolution. Okay, so it should be, should be much better at identifying those features, those shapes, those edges. Um, and then it, it then um, evaluates, so you're training the model to then evaluate uh, and output a class out of those 10 classes, right? So if you if you were to run all of that, hopefully what you'll see, uh, and I think uh, we are running out of time, um, so I don't think this is going to finish, but basically what you'll see is that the the loss is going to decrease and your accuracy is going to increase because we're now adding uh, convolution. So your model is now able to, to identify features much better. And as you can see here, this is going to take maybe uh, a minute or so to go through everything. Um, I just want to, um, as this it goes through, um, again, some more hyperparameters. And you guys can go through this again um, afterwards. But basically, uh, here we instead of doing ten epochs, we're doing twenty. Again, we could be doing fifteen. We could do a, we could be doing fifty. It just means that training the model is going to take longer. And then what we're doing here as well, and this is a new concept, uh, is we're doing a validation split. So what this means is those sixty thousand pictures. Um, the mod, we're going to be using 20% um, of those 60,000. We're going to be using it for to validate the model. Okay, so we train the model and then we validate the model um, every time. So you, you now see loss and accuracy as before, but then we also see uh, validation loss and validation accuracy. And basically, the difference is uh, this is to mimic that testing data that you do at the end. So what you can do is you can you just kind of do a split um, to increase the generalization of your model, hopefully, slightly. There's other techniques, much better techniques to do this, but the validation split is, is usually widely used um, just for you to have let's say 20%, you could do 50%, doesn't really matter, but you have 20% of that data that is not used for training, it's only used um, <clears throat> for validation. So your model here is now being uh, trained on 40,000 pictures, kind of. Okay, so actually that, that went through. So we evaluate the test accuracy the same way. And that is giving me an error. Oh, I'll have to. Interesting. This was working just yesterday. Um, but I'll I'll make sure that I didn't miss anything. Uh, but hopefully you guys won't see this error because uh, I literally tested it yesterday. Um, but I'll I'll look into it and I'll, I'll fix it uh, later on. But basically, no, it's not. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll look into this. But, uh, you can see here uh, already that our accuracy, and, and let's look at the validation accuracy here, it's already higher um, than our testing accuracy that before. And once this is fixed, you'll be able to see that the testing accuracy is actually higher as well because we're using convolution. Now, one of the things, uh, I just ran. Okay, so uh, here you, we can see um, plotted for some reason th th this plotted, but the other ones didn't. I really need to check that. But here, what we're doing is okay. Let's use some of that, uh, some from that testing data. Let's see. Uh, let's give the model uh, that we developed with that convolution. Let's give it some pictures and let's see how um, what's the output. So here we have um, three. So we have 12 pictures uh, that we give to the model and then we, we output it. And here you can see that it classifies everything fine, but this one. So it, in, in this case, it, it classified this pullover as a coat. And here you can see this is the soft max output. So here it's saying, okay, it's 100% a trouser. 
And here it's saying, okay, it's 62% occult, and I'm assuming uh, th this is pullover. So this is how you can see that actually the model got it wrong. Okay. And, and just, yeah, uh, you can you can test this. Yeah. yeah right. Just a time check. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, we pretty much done. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap in two minutes just to say that, um, okay, there's two. So we went through two models. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have um, enough time to go through everything, which um, which is fine because we we explain we explain it all um, as you go through these models. So you should be able to do it uh, by yourself if you um, if you want to. And then again, every time you at the end, you can click next. It's going to take you to the new uh, to the new model. So here in model three. So in model three and model four, uh, what we cover. And actually, I'll just present without running those models. Um, but basically, what we cover is um, overfitting and underfitting. And what I was saying, memorization versus generalization. So it's really important to understand um, if your model is being able to generalize. So underfitting, obviously, your model is not able to classify anything. Uh, a good fit is you know, it's not able to classify exactly everything. Um, in the sense that it, it's not going to memorize what a sweatshirt from a training data looks like, but it's able to um, identify any sweatshirt. So you see here, this is a good fit. And overfit is exactly like when, it, when everything just fits perfectly, that's overfitting because your model is not able to um, generalize. And yeah, there's a rule of thumb, and this is what we were building up to. Which is if the training accuracy is getting is greater than the testing accuracy, then you're overfitting, and that's because your training accuracy is really high, which means that your model knows your training data too much, and is when it sees fresh data from the testing data, is not able to generalize so well. And here, this is from your model. So this, you, if you keep going, you'll be able to see this, and this is the overfitting. So here you see. The validation accuracy is uh, 90 or 0 0.9, and the training accuracy is actually almost 100. So there's a massive gap here, and this means you know that your model is overfitting. And the steps that you do to stop your model from overfitting, you can also look at the loss, and you see that the uh, diversion. So there's things like, and again, we don't have much time now, but uh, there's basically two things that you can do. Early stopping. So early stopping just means that you stop training the model before it starts to overfit. Okay. So you you most probably stop your model here. Uh, I would say you look at the loss probably at two or three. So as they start to diverge. Uh, and then you have dropouts. So dropout just means that you randomly, you know, like we had those, let's say 128 neurons. You randomly, every time you train, you randomly drop, temporarily drop some neurons as you go through. And usually it's a fraction, so between 20% or 50% of those you can drop. And this just means that your neurons don't get used to seeing the same information over and over again, and they won't be able to generalize. They don't rely on, uh, on the information flowing, so you randomly drop them out. So hopefully that makes sense. But you can try this in the models uh, hands on as well. And that's it. Again, I know <laughs> very concept heavy, hopefully um, not um, too bad. And you can you guys can go back to the GitHub and the workshop and do it yourself. And that's it for me. Thank you for watching. Thank you for um going through with us and good luck with your hack roger back to you and alex back to you as well yeah i, I was just going to say thank you very much for your time um hopefully everyone's learned something there it'd be interesting to see whether we have any any uses of ai throughout the hack at the weekend um, looking forward to seeing that i think we're obviously a bit tight on time so if you have any questions for either roger or pedro let us know on discord and we will ask them and get back to you um 
rather than just in the comments. I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Roger and Pedro for your time. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye.